life's journey some ask themselves why the big time has passed them by they want it all and they want it now no need to wonder how or why they decide to make a connection with the bearer of life from the other side it's a self-centered new world reflection it's a one-way ticket for a hell of a ride they're making a deal whether down at the crossroads or hollywood and line they're making a deal gonna have it all for a moment in time Inspiring entertainer who wants to have the name in lights. You may be a four star general who wants the upper hand in a global fight. They're all making a deal with the chief light bearer from the other side. They're making a deal. It's an eternity thing for one hell of a ride. like to hear Night Dreams Talk Radio on your local radio station, let them know. Tell them to check out www.nightdreamstalkradio.com and thank you. You are listening to Night Dreams Talk Radio Network from our compound to you worldwide with your host, Gary Anderson. Well, hi everybody. This is Gary on Night Dreams Talk Radio. We're talking about Ron. He's wrote some major cool books about Michigan backroads. And Ron, are you still here? I'm still here. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Well, hopefully you Great. got yourself a nice cup of Jaffa or something during the break. But, you know, it, 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 how big is the swamp area out of curiosity uh, in Michigan? Well, the, uh, the, the Lost Dead Stream Swamp, I, I'm going to have to take a shot at it here. I'm going to say it's 30,000 acres. Oh, wow. So it's I mean, 30,000. It is gigantic. It is huge. And you can enter it from two or three different uh, rivers. And, and I may be wrong. It might only be 13,000 acres, but it's gigantic. Uh, it's not something you can just walk across. Once you go in, you, you really need to be able to maneuver your way around. Uh, so that it, it covers a, a half of a county. Oh, wow. That is huge. Uh, again, you're huge. saying a lot of people go in there and occasionally somebody doesn't come out. The, again, you know, people shouldn't even venture into an area if they don't know it, if they're not prepared to go there. And, and if, if even if you had some way to you know get help if you fall into a bog or into you know quicksand you know the time your help arrives you're gone well i'll tell you we're we're getting ready to go to a friend of mine and i are going to drummond island which is on the very eastern part of the upper peninsula of michigan and i have a, a 1950s aerial photograph that shows a swamp 
And in the swap are these long, perfectly parallel straight lines, 300 feet long. Uh, and they're from the air, they're big enough that we know that they're uh, two or three feet wide and probably several feet deep. Nobody has any idea what these lines are. So we're going on the 14th of this month, a friend of mine and I, and uh, we're taking great preparations because out there, there's no cell uh, coverage. We're taking waders. We're taking enough. It's only a, a half a mile to a mile off the nearest road, but no one's been there that we know of in 30 years. Oh, wow. And so a, a simple little uh, expedition like that, we're taking waders, we're taking uh, survival food, we're letting everybody know where we're going in. So if we don't appear at that same place on the, that night, come and get us because we're stuck. Oh, yeah. Uh, so even something like that, but when you're going into those kinds of places, it, it, you, you can't just go off on a lark. You have to, it's, it, it takes a lot of preparation just for your own safety. And, you know, we may, not, we may find nothing because it's been 50 years or, let's see, 70 years since this photograph was taken. But uh, we're going to go in and see if we can find it. Yeah, I wonder what it could be. I mean, that's interesting to have, you know. So. Absolutely no clue. I, I, I've, I've gone and researched. There are, uh, there are three huge stone circles about 50 miles from where I live, deep in the forest. They're 100 to 125 feet across. And they're very deep. They're they're like tanks, and there's three of them in a perfectly north and south straight line. That even people who live within 20 miles don't know they're there. But I've never seen anything like these lines. Uh, the long lines are in one direction, and there are three or four of them in a perfectly parallel group. And then there's a group of short lines a quarter mile away going in a different direction. Uh, and these are not walls. These are trenches. So walls look like one thing. You know, if they're rock walls that were someone had cleared a field, that'd be one thing. But these are trenches. Never seen anything like it. So we're going to walk in on the 14th of October and uh, take a look. Wow, you need to get back Great to me fun, and, huh? and, and tell me what you find. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And we're very excited. Uh, and hopefully it'll be... Uh, the mystery will continue because I, I can't imagine what, what we can't imagine is why anyone would dig a single trench in the swamp a hundred yards long, let alone six or seven of them parallel to each other. I mean, what, what possible purpose could that have? I just, we, we just don't have, we've never seen anything, never even heard of anything like it. How deep is the water in that area? Uh, well, I understand that uh, where we're going right now, it's pretty dry, but uh, that swamp, sometimes even chest waders aren't enough. You would need to have a canoe. But you can see from the aerial photograph that we have that these lines are coming off of dry land and going into the water. They disappear into the water. So... Um, you know, I, I can't answer the question what the conditions are like now, but the guy who is going to guide us in said that as of four or five days ago, conditions were pretty dry. Now, it's been raining here ever since, so we really don't know. Interesting. Now, it's just one of those, you know, it's just the, the toss of the, the, you know, the, the toss of the coin, whether or not we'll, we'll be able to get there. We'll be able to get to where we're going. We're just not sure what we'll be able to see. Yeah. That's the interesting part. It's so many interesting things. I had a guy on my show a week ago that has property that has these stone walls and 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 uh, uh, like a, a place where they would sacrifice people. All this was like created about four thousand years ago on his property, and it, you know, it, people go and you know take tours on his property. And you start thinking, you know, and it wasn't done by American natives. He was thinking maybe possibly, you know, the Vikings or something like that. It's so many interesting things out there in the past. We just don't know what, you know, what, what happened. 
Well, we have, we have, you're exactly right. We have, fortunately, we're in the upper peninsula of Michigan and northern Wisconsin, some of those places, some of these old constructions have uh, survived. Now, in, in the northern part of Michigan, where Traverse City is and Mount Pleasant and the famous places, that's all, all that is gone because of agriculture. Everything was, was plowed under and all the old constructions were looted to build chimneys. But in some of the, uh, there's a, 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 a state park called Neglagon over by uh, Lake Huron, where I've photographed, there's a ruin back in there that is stone walls with doors, with rooms, with cairns around it that is 300 feet long and 100 feet wide. So it's bigger than a football field. And, the, and it's still there. It's very ancient. Uh, French, uh, I understand it, French fur trappers discovered it and it was already a ruins. They asked the Native Americans what it was for. The Native Americans in the area said they didn't know it had been abandoned when they got to that area. And the only reason it still exists is because when this wilderness was declared a state forest, uh-huh. no, uh, no development had taken place. There had been no settlement there. So the ruins are still there. And no one has any idea how old it is, who built it, or what it was for. Yeah, it even can predate even the uh, Vikings and some of this stuff. It, it, it's really eerie because the one gentleman I had yeah, on. E- easily, easily predate. That. Yeah, because he, he, he's, when they did the testing and all that stuff, they estimated some parts of it was up to 8,000 years old. So, well, I mean, the the uh, you know going back to the Macintosh stone and the copper culture on the northern tip of the Keweenaw Peninsula and out in Lake Superior, there's an island called Isle Royal, and on Isle Royal and Keweenaw Peninsula are more than six thousand a uh, prehistoric pit mines where copper was mined and carbon dating on. Uh, wooden structures that are in some of these mines place them as old as 6,500 B.C. Oh, wow. And they have been estimated at more than a half a million tons. Half a million tons of copper was removed from these mines and transported somewhere. Uh, and there's no record of that much copper in the North American uh, archaeological record. So the speculation is that this copper was mined by Phoenicians, Minoans, or Vikings and taken back to Europe to supply the Bronze Age, which was uh, 2400 B.C. to 1200 B.C. Yeah, and, you, and you think and, you think Columbus was the one that discovered America and all that stuff. Oh, yeah, he yeah. was a late comer. Yeah, very late. Comer. Yeah, he, he was late for he was late for school. Oh yeah, yeah. So this this copper, uh, we we know that it was moved over there because the copper. Just to give you, your listeners an idea, the copper in in the, this part of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan is ninety nine percent pure. You don't have to smelt it. You can pick it up off the ground, and you can begin to work it right there. All you got to do is start hammering away at it, and you can you can combine it with tin to make bronze. We have a, there's a piece of copper that was removed from uh, Lake Superior in the 1970s. It's on display at a museum here. It's pure copper, 99.9% pure, weighs 38,000 pounds. Oh, wow. 19 tons of pure copper. And it was just, it was found 100 yards offshore, just sticking out of the ground. And this copper was all left behind when the, it's called float copper. It was left behind when the glaciers receded and it just kind of fell down out of the ice and was laying on top of the ground. Uh, the Antonagam boulder was a boulder that was estimated to be over 5,000 pounds of pure copper. It was sitting on the bank of the Antonagam River and it was moved to the Smithsonian Institute where it is today. Uh, and so there, when you talk about predating Columbus, people were coming here, the evidence shows, to get copper for whatever purposes they needed because they, this was before smelting had been discovered. The copper, you could just pick it up and use it. And this is from, uh, let's see, this is 2019. We're talking about 6,000 years ago. 